From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Benker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we have unfiltered conversations about love and marriage, work and family, and everything in between. If you need some confirmation, some affirmation, or some inspiration, you have landed in the right place. This podcast is all about exposing the false cultural narratives that are undermining your ability to be successful in love. So today we're going to talk about the ideal age to get married, particularly for women. But first, I want to welcome everyone back after my long hiatus and give you a little update on what's been going on. I'm so happy to be back, and I really missed doing this program, but I've been up to my eyeballs with a house project that is taking way longer than expected. It was supposed to be, I mean, I thought, seriously, like three or four months tops, and it's almost a year later, and it's actually still underway, and it's just a room. <laughs> it's literally just a room. Um, anyway, so I am, I'm also no longer going to an office to work because I wanted to work from home and I haven't been able to work from home because of the noise. So I've been somewhat homeless, but all of that has been worked out. So we're good now and I'm back. However, not with the online course I had promised that is still underway and I just didn't want to wait anymore to return to the show. So here I am. Hope that's okay with you all. Also wanted to say that the podcast may be bi-monthly to start, but eventually back to weekly, just, just to get into, just to get into it again, if you will. So if you don't see it on a given week, don't think I've disappeared. It's just, um, I'm going to start out that way potentially. I also plan to occasionally pepper the, pepper the weekly podcast with short bonus episodes on some specific topic I want to cover, like maybe some new research that's just been released or a political something or other, or even just to do a quick Q&A with a listener question. And remember, by the way, I can be reached at Suzanne at the SuzanneBankerShow.com. So be looking for that sort of short, those short bonus episodes as well. Finally, I wanted to make a note about coaching um, because a lot of people are wondering uh, what's going on with that. So I do still offer single sessions. You just go to SuzanneBanker.com forward slash coaching. I used to offer, you can read all about it there. I used to offer long-term coaching for couples that was very involved and intense, and I'm not doing that at this time, but you can still sign up for a single session or two. And just a quick note about my coaching for those of you who aren't familiar. As you might imagine, my process is not one that would be approved of or taught in marriage counseling programs where they have all these rules about what you can and can't say to clients. I mean, honestly, when you get a, degree in those, in that department, you're supposed to, they, they teach you basically to just sit there and listen and not talk much, especially about yourself. And you're not supposed to give any advice. So that just would never work for me, which is why I coach. Um, coaching is very different from counseling. I do not remain neutral. I will occasionally talk about my own marriage and I definitely offer concrete advice and solutions. I also feel that my strength is getting to the heart of things right away so you don't spend endless hours and a boatload of money the way you would in therapy to solve the problem. I am all about solutions. So if you find yourself stuck in your marriage or your relationship or even in the world of dating and you want me to help you or me help you, I should say, get unstuck, once again, you can go to SuzanneBanker.com forward slash coaching. Okay, so on that note, let's dive into today's topic. So my 22-year-old daughter, who graduates from college next month, I can't believe it, recently received a wedding invitation from her freshman year roommate. Apparently at this particular university, like many others in the South, finding a spouse through one's fraternity or sorority is not uncommon. My own college experience was really different in that I graduated from a large public university on the East Coast where merely talking about marriage was verboten. In fact, that's a really interesting conversation, I think. I should probably have an episode on it, on geography and how, how vastly different people's lives are based on where, what area of the country they grew up and what the values are and all of that. Really interesting stuff. But anyway, this invitation my daughter received has had me thinking a lot about the ideal age to marry, especially for women. And I want to talk about, no surprise here, some of the aspects of this conversation that go unmentioned. Like, for example the differences between women and men when it comes to mapping out a life, 
and the fact that millions of women are preparing for a life that most of them won't ultimately want. And here's what I mean by that. The vast majority of women change when they hit their childbearing years. The world begins to look very different, but they were encouraged to map out a life as though this massive transformation wasn't going to happen and therefore find themselves stuck because they've made all these decisions about love and money and career based on the idea that their priorities would never change and that finding a man to marry can easily happen at any age. Neither of these is true. So many young women today long to get married and have a family, but live at a time when it's taboo to admit this. It's very much like I imagine some women felt in the 1950s when the expectation was that they'd get married and have babies right away when many of them wanted to wait a bit to focus on career. So all we've done then is rob Peter to pay Paul. Just as it should have been acceptable in the 50s for women to wait a few years if they wanted to, although I understand why they didn't, um, or even not to marry at all if that's what they wanted, it should be equally acceptable for women today to prioritize marriage over career. But it's not. The status quo in the U.S. is that the best marriages consist of two people who've established themselves financially and professionally after being single for a really long time. <laughs> I mean, that's just how, how you're supposed to do it. This mindset is so ingrained in our culture that talk of people marrying in their 20s, or at least early to mid-20s, is met with complete shock. One might assume that since I married for the first time at age 23 and got divorced four years later, that I'd be a card-carrying member of the early to mid-20s is too young to get married club. I am not. I've been married to my second husband for almost a quarter century, and I've had plenty of time to think long and hard about my own story, as well as the stories of others whose marriages did and did not last. My conclusion is that chalking this conversation up to a matter of age is lazy. It isn't age per se that matters, but the mindset and the circumstances of those who are tying the knot. They either have the right mindset and the right circumstances, or they don't. And this absolutely holds true whether someone is 25 or 35 when they get married. Don't assume that just because you're in your 30s, you've got the right attitude and mindset. Now, it's true that married couples 24 and under have a high divorce rate. However, this statistic combines teens who marry with 23-year-olds who marry, which makes zero sense to me. There's a huge difference between a teenager and a 23-year-old, and I think we can all agree that teenagers should not be getting married. Still, it is true that those who marry on the younger side have a lack of maturity that they have to contend with. As Nicholas Wolfinger wrote at the Institute for Family Studies, quote, most youthful couples do not have the maturity, coping skills, and social support it takes to marriage work. In the face of routine marital problems, Teens and young 20-somethings lack the wherewithal necessary for happy resolutions, end quote. So I don't disagree with this at all, except that many of today's 30-something couples also lack the wherewithal for, for happy resolutions. I've seen it up close. This cohort does not have the maturity and outlook that 30-somethings did 40 years ago. I don't know that I've heard anyone address the shocking lack of maturity that exists today among those in their 20s and 30s when compared to past generations. Our parents and grandparents grew up much faster as a result of having experienced the kind of sacrifices and, har and hardship that the modern generation just hasn't. In fact, that's an episode right there. So to me, the real meat of the argument about when to marry is not so much about age as it is about whether or not a couple has the maturity, coping skills, and social, social support needed to be married that Wolfinger pointed out. Some Couples do, some young couples do, I should say, and some don't. The research doesn't document maturity, nor does it discuss personality, by the way, and yet both of these things matter a great deal. So there are just so many variables. And then there's the issue of when men and women, respectively, should consider marrying. We all know that women typically mature faster than men do, which is why I personally think it's better for men to be at least in their mid-20s before they marry. Although there again, it depends. My son, for example, is 
far more mature at 19 than my ex-husband was at 25. Again, so much depends on personality and how we are raised. I doubt my son will wait until his 30s to get married like many men do today. I can't even envision him doing that, knowing him as I do, but I mean, it's possible. But it wouldn't scare me or shock me or worry me if he didn't, if he got married earlier, I guess is what I'm saying. And for the record, I I think it's important that couples who meet in college, since that's how this episode started, talking about my daughter's um, freshman year roommate, I think it's important for couples who meet in college to test their relationship in the real world before getting engaged. I told my daughter that consistently these past few years because she's in a very serious relationship as well with a man that we like very much. But making the decision to get married while still in college is taking a big risk, in my opinion. College is not the real world, and you have to know whether or not your relationship will transfer to real life. I I think it's great to meet a potential spouse in college, actually, because at no other time will people have such an array of great options before them. Ask anyone out in the dating world, they'd be like, oh, I'd love to have that environment to choose, you know, in which to choose somebody. But I'm a stickler about living in the real world first. Not together, separately, but out in the world. And fortunately, my daughter and her boyfriend are doing just that. So we'll see. There are also many parents who I believe let their own experiences, either with divorce or with romantic regrets, be a barometer for what they think their children should or shouldn't do. So these are typically the parents who warn their kids not to do what they did, rather than provide context and a thorough explanation for what happened in their case. Because it may not be applicable to the young person's story, their, their child, their adult child story. So instead, they teach their kids to focus all their intention on money and career and to worry about marriage later. This is extremely common. I mean, in my own world as well, for sure. I mean, what I'm saying right now is very countercultural, and I have a lot of friends who are just not going to just not going to agree with me. And they're, that's perfectly fine. I love them anyway. Maybe this will convince them otherwise. Maybe not. Here's the problem, though. These well-meaning parents, when they say, you know, do get married later, worry about marriage later, don't think about that now, they leave out any reasonable alternative for how a 20-something is supposed to live in the meantime. How do you date? How do you exist within a relationship for potentially years at a time, not knowing whether it's going to last? And what about cohabitation? The only message young people get on this topic is that it's perfectly fine to do, that everyone does it, and that there are no downsides, when of course there are. The biggest being the fact that should a cohabiting couple eventually marry, most ultimately slide into marriage because they're already there and it just sort of makes sense to do, as opposed to making a well thought out decision to marry. That's a completely different approach than what people should do when they're making this very hugely important decision. In fact, the research shows very clearly that couples who lived together first before being engaged or married struggle more than couples who did not and are more likely to divorce. But parents don't add this information to the equation when they tell their children to worry about marriage later. You can't just give that advice and leave it at that, especially not for your daughters who have a different set of circumstances to consider than your sons do. Millions of young people today are flailing about in the wind when it comes to their romantic relationships. They have no blueprint for how to move through their 20s when marriage is not on the radar or not supposed to be on the radar. So there was a great piece from Matt Walsh. I'm sure if you listen to me, you likely listen to Matt Walsh or at least know who he is. And this is from a few years ago. And, you know, he's very sarcastic, although, I mean, yeah, he's very sarcastic. I don't know if that'll come through in what I'm about to read, but he wrote a, uh, a piece called Avoid the Pointless Heartache. If you don't want to get married, don't date. <laughs> and it was essentially just an argument for courtship as opposed to dating. You know, that what's happening with the dating scene today is just hopeless. And that in the past it was courtship. And that that's basically dating with a purpose. So he writes, quote, don't date just for the sake of dating. Sure, you can take a stroll through the park just for the sake of strolling through the park but dating ain't a stroll in the park. It's a complicated and serious thing. It can also be fun, but it isn't something you should do for pure recreation. Dating is supposed to be a means to an end, or maybe a better way of putting it, dating is a means to a beginning. 
To put it simply, if you know for a fact that you would never marry a certain person, then you shouldn't be in a romantic relationship with them. Knowingly staying in a relationship without a future is like riding a dying horse into the desert. It's a slow, painful death march, and there is no chance of it working out in your favor. So go ahead and date, but date with a purpose. Date with a goal. Date with your eyes toward marriage. I know that might seem old-fashioned. In fact, it is old-fashioned, which is why you should listen to it. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> oh, yes. My thoughts exactly. Okay. And then he goes on to explain how the modern dating strategy is completely different and helpless and all the rest. And I have to tell you, as a relationship coach, I can see how the message about postponing marriage indefinitely with no advice on what to do in the meantime backfires for women in particular. It actually backfires for men too, but I'm going to focus on women. Parents are giving the same advice to their daughters about mapping out a life as they do to their sons. This is not helpful because women get pregnant and men do not. You can't just avoid that conversation. And because most women, even today, are the parent who steps back, parents who step back from the workforce to care for children. Even if they don't do it full time and year round the way our grandmothers or grandmothers did, they still choose to be home as much as possible. There's also this. Women do not become more eligible with age the way men do. Even in a post-feminist world, most women still look for security. Again, because they're the ones who get pregnant. While men are happy to marry down, quote unquote down, meaning someone who's younger and less successful than he is. The mating strategy just is not the same for both sexes. So the messaging cannot be the same. This whole, what I just said, just makes dating near or around the age of 30, a numbers game, essentially, where men are in the driver's seat. When women are younger, they have the advantage. The most difficult conversations I have are with 30-something women who are desperate for a baby with a husband nowhere in sight. It's a serious problem, you guys, and it's affecting this whole culture because families aren't getting created. That's what a big deal this is. Here's the underlying problem with the career first, love later mindset. Who we choose to marry and how that marriage fares has the single greatest effect on our happiness and well being than anything else we do. Nothing even comes close. Our choice in a mate literally determines the entire directions of our li- direction of our lives. Once you make that decision, everything else is just a domino effect. What sense does it make then to put the decision about whom to spend one's life with at the bottom of the list? It's true that careers can also determine the direction we go, our lives will go, but they are replaceable. People are not. You can't just swap out a spouse the way you can a job or a career. In fact, the research is clear that when people do do this, the divorce rate goes up exponentially. 67% of second marriages fail. And 74% of third marriages fail. That's why getting it right the first time is a gold mine. The most common reason people give for why young people should wait to marry rests with the notion of finding oneself or of developing one's identity. I'm going to give you a different spin on this, okay? It's not that I don't appreciate the sentiment. I, I absolutely do because I am not the same person today as I was at 25. But here's the thing. We humans are constantly in the process of becoming. It takes decades to know, to truly understand who we are, because who we are is always evolving. So if we were to use that logic as a gauge for when to marry, we should really never get married at all. (laughs) Because I'm also not the same person today as I was when I was 40. There's no magical day where... You say, okay, I found myself. And a potential spouse is just there waiting in the wings. More often than not, what ends up happening, because I see it all the time, is that women reach the age of 30 and they marry whoever they happen to be in love with or living with because they know that time is running out and they want a family. At this stage of life, women are typically not thinking objectively the way they would if they had 
time on their side. It's true that to be successfully married, you need a strong sense of self. On that, I would agree. You need to know where you're going and how you plan to get there. And you shouldn't be getting married if you don't know those things. But as I said, some people know this earlier than others do. Either which way, at the end of the day, your identity as a couple will have far more impact on your marital success than will your individual identity. In fact, I would argue that those who are in a serious relationship should stop working on themselves as individuals and start working on their relationship as a couple. The goal needs to be, how are we going to grow together? And here's something that may surprise you. A new report comparing early marriage to later marriage, the report is called State of Our Unions 2022, shows that almost half of young people today are either married or want to marry earlier rather than later. What motivates these folks is the desire to build a family, and that begins with marriage. A family-focused individual who marries another family-focused individual who both agree on several major topics, such as money lifestyle, money and lifestyle and work family structure, and who both have the social support they need, has a high probability of being happily married regardless of age. There's also been this new development. 30-something marriages have begun to incur a higher divorce risk than those who marry in their 20s. After age 32, the odds of divorce increase by 5% per year. Now, this will surprise people who are convinced that later is always better, but you have to go deeper with this issue. For one thing, by the time men and women are in their 30s, they've accrued a complicated relationship history that can wreak havoc on a marriage, particularly if children are involved. But it can be true even if there are no children. We know from the research that having multiple relationships and or sexual partners prior to marriage greatly increases one's chances of divorce, mainly because we underestimate what it means for a woman in particular, although it can be true of men as well, to have over and over again fallen in love with someone or gone to bed with someone or possibly even lived with someone only to have these relationships end. This leaves scars and those scars have to go somewhere. So when we finally do marry, just like we bring our childhood experiences with us, we bring our sexual histories too. Here's something else to keep in mind. The 45% of young adults in this country who prefer to be married, that's from the research I just mentioned, and we'll make a link to this research in the show notes, cannot be compared to their parents or grandparents. These folks are not choosing this path because they have to or because it's expected of them. Quite the opposite. They're choosing it because they want to. And that's a huge distinction. If we as parents and as a society do not support them in this desire, they will be far more likely to fail when they pull the trigger. That's the social support. Far too many women today are products of divorce. Far too many people are products of divorce and grew up hearing that they should never depend on a man and they mapped out their lives accordingly. Many of these women reach childbearing age having regretted listening to this advice. To be clear, I am not suggesting it is always bad to marry later. That's not my point. Delayed marriage is a perfectly viable path for those who refrain from casual sex, cohabitation, and unwed births. The problem is that few young adults avoid these things, which is one of the reasons why they struggle so much when they do get married, if they get married. What I am suggesting is that the older adults in this country, parents mainly, not be so quick to accept the status quo about prioritizing career over marriage. It is long overdue, in my opinion, from my vantage point, given what I see, and given how things are working out for young people today in the relationship department, to revisit the idea that marriage should be the last thing on young people's minds. So with that in mind, here are five great reasons to marry earlier rather than later, for women in particular. 
Number one, the pool of marriageable men narrows as women age. Don't shoot the messenger. I didn't make this up. Google it. You'll see it out there. It's just reality. Women in their 30s are at a huge disadvantage when they're looking for a husband because the good men are either already married or they tend to marry younger women. Goes back to that mating strategy again, just totally different for women and for men. So many women in their 30s today end up marrying men who are not good husband material because the pickings are slim and you don't want to be in that boat if you don't have to be. Which that doesn't mean, by the way, that those folks who are in their 30s who for whom this resonates, that doesn't mean they're doomed and their marriages are doomed. I am an optimist and I believe all marriages, not all marriages, take that back. I believe that any marriage can be quote unquote saved, if that's the word, with two people who are willing and want it with a complete mind shift, even at that age. So I'm not saying that you're screwed if you get married in your thirties at all. In fact, I got married in my thirties the second time, but again, I didn't have children with my first husband and that made all the difference in the world. And my husband had never been married before. So again, going back to those circumstances, right? Number two, it's much better to look for a husband when you're not up against the clock. The biological clock is real. I don't care how unpopular it is to talk about it's real. And you will think much more objectively about whom to marry when it isn't ticking so loudly in your ear. It just, you have a whole different mindset when that's not happening versus then when it is. And you don't want to make decisions like that when you're under the gun in the ideal, in the ideal world. And this is about the ideal age to marry. That's what this topic is. That's what this podcast is about. Number three, it's easier to get pregnant. You're just much more likely to avoid a miscarriage or two, which is no small thing, by the way. Plus you'll have the option to choose what size family you want. Number four, your relationship, I'm sorry, your children will know their grandparents and the benefits of this relationship are huge. They're just huge. Again, no conversation about this. You never hear anything about this, but grandparents are an enormous help when your kids are young too. And if you have children later in life, your parents will likely not have the energy that they need to help out. And five, Here's another unspoken one. It is significantly easier to build wealth with two people than it is with one. Student loans or no student loans, attacking debt and combining two incomes is the best and fastest path to financial success. You'll get there much faster than you would on your own. So this idea of I'm going to wait until, you know, all my my finances are straightened out, even though I'm up to my eyeballs in debt, And then I'll find a spouse. That's just not going to work. It's not working. Don't let money be the reason why you don't get married is what I'm saying. Because two people will be more successful if they have the right uh, and the same approach. The bottom line is that the idea that people should get married only after they've found themselves and have established themselves financially is bogus, in my opinion if that is your only reasoning for not, you know, for getting married later. The number one answer millennials give for why they're not married is that they can't afford to get married. So clearly the plan for becoming financially sound and then getting married isn't working. And in the meantime, their ability to get pregnant or to even find someone suitable to marry while they're accruing all this money that they're not really accruing because they're up to their eyeballs in debt is falling by the wayside. So in conclusion, I would like to throw out a brand new idea. Establishing oneself professionally and financially and being married does not have to be an either or dilemma because getting married on the earlier side doesn't have to mean having children right away if you don't want them. If you do, great. Lots of advantages to that as well. But getting married and having children simultaneously, the way so many millennials do today since they're getting married at the last possible moment to be able to have a family, it does not have to be one entity. In the past, a woman getting married meant she'd also become a mother shortly thereafter. That's why there was more of a decision for women to make regarding career and marriage back then, whereas now the conflict is more between career and motherhood. It really doesn't need to be between career and marriage. 
In fact, there are so many women who put good men back in the sea, so to speak, because they believe it's not time to get married yet. Even though there are no red flags in the relationship and everything's going fine. I think this is a huge mistake that women are making solely because they've been sold on the idea that marriage is best done later. But the reality is there's a third option. If you've found a great match and you're not ready to have children because your career is taking center stage, get married and don't have kids until later. I have a friend who got married at 23 and didn't have kids for nine years. (laughs) You don't have to go that far. But the point is, if you've found your person, you can both work for a number of years and get serious about your finances during that time so that when kids do come along, which for most couples they will, you're good to go. You don't have all those huge dilemmas about how are we going to afford children or how am I going to be able to stay home for a few years and all the rest. I don't know why this idea hasn't gained more traction, but it should. Once again, if you ask the average single person today, they'll tell you they're not married because of finances, but that's not a reason to not get married. It's a reason to get married because two people who are on the same page about money will reach success twice as fast than they would if they were going it alone. There just are so many variables to the question of when to marry. And at the end of the day, just I want people to think it through very carefully without considering social and parental pressures and without considering what's um, acceptable and unacceptable. I know that's hard to do, but as I repeat time and again on this podcast and elsewhere, the more countercultural you are, the more successful you will be. Your investment in a single marriage-minded relationship will hold the best return, much more so than any degree you earn or any job you hold. And that wraps up today's episode. Please share this podcast with at least one friend or family member you think would enjoy it. And don't forget, you can reach me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.